So you guys can all see my slides, that's great. I'm uh, Floyd Besser, uh, one of the LMC up in Prince George here for Northern Interior. And I work as a critical care paramedic out of 580. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, bleeding. So I know it is the long weekend and thanks to everybody for taking time out of your day for coming in and, and uh, doing some learning today. Uh, when I was thinking about this presentation, I, I tried to think of you know what would be a good topic. Recently we've had trauma, we've had obstetrics, we've had a whole bunch of uh, presentations of different topics. And I thought, you know, this is Stop the Bleed Month. We've got these initiatives going on. This is a nationwide thing. I know at Trauma Services, uh, trauma meetings yesterday, this was, uh, this was mentioned. Um, and there's courses we're instructing people around. We have a local course up here in Prince George on May 23rd. So I thought, what a better way to um, bridge that gap and, um, and talk about that. This is not, I'll set, I'll set this thing right now, this is not a trauma talk. So we won't be talking about uh, bleeding in the context of the trauma patient specifically uh, and approaches to hemostatic management. That is not what we're going to talk about today. There was a great talk uh, just last month at the Clinical Medical Programs Forum by Dr. Wheeler, uh, Adam Green, and Dr. Robert about the use of pre-hospital blood products and hemostasis. Um, and then there was a good debate between Adam and Oli about use of plasma in the pre-hospital context. Um, we're not going to we're not going to touch on any of those um, high-level sexy topics today. Um, hopefully, in the future, we'll have a, we'll maybe do another one specifically related to that. And so, I I hope we have a breadth of experience in the audience today, um, from the young guns to the the uh, the veterans. Um, and think about a little bit about uh, sort of the context of, of this bleeding that we're going to talk about today. I wonder, I mean, this happens to me all the time in that, um, you know, I go through a call or go through a case and, you know, you go right according to protocol, you give all the medications appropriately, everything goes really well, it's all good. And this probably happens more as you get along, further along in your career and then everything gets put aside. But sometimes you sit out and you day, you know, you're daydreaming, thinking about going through it. And sometimes the curiosity gets to you and you ask questions. And you don't really know what's the background. You know, you kind of forget after once in a while and become very, become very clinically focused and forget all of that basic pathophysiology as to the who, what, why, when, where we do these things. So I think it's a good review, and for me this was a great review um, to talk about um, some of this stuff. I went through, you know, I went went back into medical school. I was a physio before I went medical school, um, but I went back in because I wanted to have more knowledge, and I hope that that's what's happening here. And I think the profession of paramedicine is growing, and it's good to push ourselves and learn a little bit more the context of, of some of these topics and asking the hard questions as to why are we truly doing that. Medicine is so diverse and it's changing every day. And uh, we, uh, we sometimes don't question things quite enough um, and need to look at, at why we're doing things. Learning itself uh, is, is a hard thing. Everybody has a different learning style. So some people are very auditory, some people are very verbal, some people are very tactile. Everybody's got a little bit of a different approach to it. One thing that's been relatively well proven out there is that we do learn well through spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is basically you learn a concept, and the basics of it are you forget a concept, and you relearn a concept as you get exposed to it again. You maybe learn a little bit more about it, then you forget again, but you retain that little bit, and then the next time you see it, you start to consolidate it. And every time you do that, um, you pick up a little bit more and a little bit more and a better and better understanding, especially as you're able to put it into a context uh, or apply it to a patient. So that's hopefully what we'll, we'll look at doing today with, in the context of bleeding. We're going to go on a little bit of a journey uh, and go back to some really basic stuff that some people are going to probably get a bit nauseous about. Um, 
but hopefully it'll let you make you go into it, read a little bit more, and understand some of the concepts. Well, here's, uh, as I mentioned, I'm an LMC up in the Northern Interior. I work as as well, casually. Um, I don't have any financial links with any of the uh, items that we're going to mention or talk about today. I do have a disclaimer though. I am an eMERGE doc. I am not a hematologist. I'll let you guys decide who is what. Geek versus nerd. I read this, I read this thing a little bit and I was like, yeah, you know, probably me. Um, I definitely use a Mac. Um, contentious and long-winded, for your sake, I really hope not. So here's a bit of the outlay of what I want to talk about today. Three major overarching topics. I want to review the physiology of hemostatic control and the hemostatic balance. What actually happens in our blood system um, as we clot or fail to clot. Look at some of the highlights of what's within our own protocols uh, and some medications that we actually may use uh, or not use um, that may relate to bleeding. And then go through a case based approach. Uh, there are about five cases that we'll walk through and try to re highlight some of these things. So, a bit of spaced repetition through the, uh, through the presentation. So, Blood flow is all about balance. We all know that. Um, it, it represents the procoagulant and anticoagulant balance. How do we keep blood flowing? If everything is normal, you know, there's a way for us to clot. That's the way we stop bleeding inherently, physiologically. Uh, and when all those factors are still, they're still in your body, still floating around. So what checks and controls does our body actually have to balance that? It's very delicate, uh, very intricate, and pretty cool. And we'll talk through some of that today. You can either have that aggressive flow on one side or the stagnant water on the other side. Um, and where the, the beaver fits in is yet to be determined. So to jump a little bit back into physiology, I'm sure everybody has seen this at some point in their career, depending on what your background is, from EMR right through to CCP, you've seen this either in, maybe in high school, maybe through your training, you've maybe seen it a few times in training. I, for one, um, and if there's any physicians in the room, I know Dr. Spooner is here, um, I, for one, am regularly having to review this, uh, going through all the concepts and cases. So five major players, you've got your vessels, your platelets, your coagulation factors, Regulation and then the fibrinolysis or the lytic um, factors that are involved. Okay, so those are your, your main highlight hitters. Okay, let's go to first. I'm going to start going through the actual process of, of how we clot in our in our system um, or how we stop clotting. I just want to back up a little bit and go all the way back to where these things come from. So this is an actual playlist, kind of a cool picture. This is what you would call an activated playlist. It's got a little bit different morphology than normal. Where, where do playlists come from? Just ask yourself in your head. Where, about, where are they produced? How do they, how do they come to be? I feel like, I feel like I should have put up a quiz in this talk. I was thinking about that this morning on the way in. I put up a quiz up front, much like. Maybe going to date myself, but my parents used to have Reader's Digest all the time. You know, they have those, there's those quizzes um, that, that give you varying levels of what your ability is. Um, so platelets, where do they come from? They come from bone marrow, much like the rest of our, our blood cells. They start with a stem cell that's formed in the marrow of uh, predominantly long bones. And then that stem cell differentiates itself based on different uh, triggers uh, is as to whether it goes into a red blood cell, a white blood cell, a platelet. And then even amongst those, it all splits and differentiates. And so you can see here, please don't try to memorize this, this table. Um, 
I'm going to draw. Hopefully, you guys can all see. This is my. I'm uh, pretty high tech. I got my iPad, so I'm able to draw on my presentation. Um, and stem cells are at the top. And again, we talk about how they branch off, branch off. This pathway here. This is where the platelets themselves come from. So they have these factors that are released that differenti help differentiate them uh, into first a megakaryocyte and then breaks itself off into these thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are fancy work for platelets. And so all the way back to the beginning. That's how, that's where the platelets actually come from and the rest of the contents of your blood. So coagulation factors. We're going to talk about that in hemostasis. Um, and for those who have studied this at all and in depth, this is complicated. There's so many of them and it's hard to figure out the cascades, but they, where do they get produced? Does anybody know off the top of their head where they get produced predominantly? You're right, the liver. So the liver is what pumps out these factors that we're going to talk about as we go through the pathway. And this is just a little bit of histology. I just gave a talk to the medical students last at the end of last week, um, the graduating class, and was ch chatting with some of them afterwards and <laughs> asking them if they remembered any of their histology. Uh, the ones that went into pathology did, um, but the rest of them were like, yeah, I'm a little bit sketchy on, uh, on the actual background on it. This is just a slice of liver histology, and there's different cell lines that are in here. Um, you see sinusoids and hepatocytes. And so the different cells within the liver itself produce the factors, the coagulation factors, and different ones. You can see von Willebrand's here, and factor eight, which are pretty important uh, for multiple reasons, are different than the ones above. And the, the reason you need to know this is because you know, if you, if you have a patient coming in with underlying liver disease or you're taking a history, you've got a cirrhotic patient, um, you have to take into context that you know, if they're bleeding from somewhere, you think, well, it may just be because of varices or blood backing up. They've got big blood vessels that have engorged in their esophagus and let go, and now they've got an upper GI bleed. But they may also not have the ability to reverse their hemostatic component. Um, because they, they lack the ability to produce these factors, okay? I know, so you guys are all looking up at the screen now and going, seriously, Professor, really? <laughs> like, wow, we're gonna, this is stuff that So I really want to talk now about the major components of hemostasis and go through some of the hemostatic patterns um, that actually happen when you have bleeding and how our body stops it. So there's three major components and we'll simplify this again, we'll break it down more and more. We have primary hemostasis, there's secondary hemostasis, and then there's clot stabilization, and then there's degradation and breakup. Okay? So when you look at the whole gamut from the time somebody starts bleeding to the time that they heal um, and the clot itself gets dissolved and breaks up, those are the four major steps. Four major steps. And we'll go through all the major steps um, just to review. We're not going to go through, again, I'm not a hematologist. Uh, you can get into some of these hematology textbooks, which I sunk my teeth back into, and there is some serious complexity there. Uh, the bench science behind this is really complex. And there's even a lot of conflicting um, uh, professionals out there right now saying, well, the, the, the classic cascade pathway that we're always taught, intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, which we'll talk about, is maybe not the true way to do it. Maybe there's a cell model that's a bit better. And so the science is shifting right now. Like in the last 10 years, there's been a bunch of uh, papers put out about this shifting cell model. So in medical schools, the curriculum is probably going to change in the next five to 10 years about this little thing. But I'm going to bore you with this stuff today, and then I'll let you uh, do some space repetition in, 
in a couple of years and uh, and reintroduce this. And this is just worry of what you just saw in the pictorial. So a little bit less. Um, I'm all about tactile, so I, I write things out, that's how I remember it. So by having a step-by-step -step process, this is what the wording is of what you just saw in the previous slide. So the four components of hemostatic control and hemostasis. So primary hemostasis essentially is vasoconstriction. So the blood vessel, you cut the blood vessel and I'm going to draw a knife here. Um, you cut the blood vessel and you get vasoconstriction. The wall actually shrinks down locally. There's inflammatory mediators locally that are released and cause that vessel to shrink because that helps to reduce the flow, right? And just reduce the, the amount of disruption on the plaque. And then what happens is you get the formation of a platelet flow. And so the platelets that we talked about that come from the bone marrow um, along the lineage of megakaryocytes, they all fly in and they stick together. So this is a normal platelet. This is an unactivated platelet right here. This platelet's got a little receptor called the GP receptor. Now you don't have to remember all these details. Like remember the big picture. You don't need to memorize O von Willebrand's factor, which is important. Um, there are diseases that it affects, but the von Willebrand factor is in the collagen. So where the cut is on the vessel, down on the bottom left here, so the base of this all has collagen in there. And this collagen is what you're seeing right here. And that's where the von Willebrand factor is, and then the platelet links to it. Once that platelet links to it, there's an internal trigger for the platelet to let go or release uh, substances outside of it, which make it conform. And so it changes and activates. And so that picture we showed of the purple platelet initially is an activated platelet that's got these little arms. That's triggered by thromboxane, which is going to be interesting as linked to our protocols. We'll see later as we talk a little bit about this as to how the, how the thromboxane actually works and we affect it. And thromboxane and ADP are released. And then all these other platelets surrounding are activated. And then they aggregate and they've got all these little binding sites where they bind together to form that initial initial platelet plug. And so that's what blocks off the initial flow. And then from that flow and those inflammatory mediators and these platelets that are now aggregated, they're going to release other things that are going to trigger the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is going to be secondary hemostasis. So now we've gone through vasoconstriction and development of a platelet plug, primary hemostasis. That phase has been done. This is secondary hemostasis. And this is what I was talking about, that cascade. This is the cascade of the back of our secondary hemostasis. And this is where all these complex factors the and all this stuff come into play. Sorry guys, if somebody, if somebody just called in, if you could mute your mic, that would be great. Okay. So, thank now. You. All right, thank you. Good, there we go, got it, awesome. Yeah, you're front and center uh, on the camera. So now we've got the secondary factor. So we've got these contact factors, and that was what I said gets released from the vessel wall to say, okay, we've got all these platelets aggregated, now we really need to form a good, a good um, fiber or a good clot so that more blood doesn't leak out of this vessel and keep leaking out. So now all of these things, now this is super complex. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a much easier way to remember all this. But there's a propagation pathway down, this is called the intrinsic pathway classically. And this side over here is called the extrinsic pathway. So I'm going to draw intrinsic and extrinsic. Those two pathways work in conjunction with one another. 
because as you can see, this intrinsic pathway comes down. It's the slower of the two. Some resources say it's about six minutes for this pathway to happen. is released here and it blends with factor 7 and causes this complex. Now the complex keeps that cascade rolling and it happens a lot faster. It also works to influence and speeds up the intrinsic pathway through this right here, this little link. And both of these now influence the development of the common pathway. Those two will develop the common pathway. And the ultimate outcome of the common pathway is the development of thrombin. Confused yet? Slightly. Mm -hmm. Slightly. Why, why is there a big difference between the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway? Why is it? Yeah. So it's, it all comes down to, to which one, like where the trigger comes from. So the tissue factor here is what truly gets released from the underlying damaged tissue. And so that one is the quickest. And then what it does is because it does, and we talked about how much quicker it is, so that's the one that initiates the, the, the proper, the initiate. So that's why this is called initiation. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. what happens first. And then oh, there's other little things inflammatory mediators that are released that start to trigger all the rest of these um, factors to kind of go down their cascade um, and happen. And so that's why they're two, different, they're two different things and they work in conjunction. Now again, this is being challenged, this model, this is the classic, like what we get taught, this is the foundation of clotting, this is being challenged. This is a bit of a hybrid of the two because this does show us the cascade model that I'm talking about, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, with the cell-based model, which is all about initiation, propagation, and amplification. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a pathway where it all happens on the platelet itself and right at the site of injury. Okay? So don't get too caught up in all the too much of the details. Um, just know that that's the pathway and all these factors, and the factors are the ones that are secreted by the liver, uh, that those are the ones that, that are going to form this thrombin. Thrombin is in turn going to link with fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is a component of our plasma um, that's around and it's there for this, this reason. It doesn't get activated. We talked about before about the dam versus the, the waterfall, right? And so it's just floating around. If it just got activated willy-nilly, then we just have clots everywhere. Right? But it needs to it needs to bind with this thrombin in order to form soluble fibrin. So the fibrin itself, just think of it as like like a meshwork essentially. Um, and if we if I go back here, oops. So this platelet plug, what's going to happen in this platelet plug is once you get fibrin formed. The fibrin is like little pieces of ribbon, essentially, and that all goes in, and in between all these platelets, all this ribbon blends in with it, and that causes a mesh, which strengthens the clot itself, okay? So that causes that clot, stable, stable clot. Factor 13 gets released again by a cascade of inflammatory reactions and everything else. And then that, that fibrin mesh that's formed becomes insoluble and it's cross-linked. So it links with itself and it stabilizes. And that's what a clot is. When you see, you know, you put a dressing on someone and it's taken five, ten minutes, and then you kind of lift the dressing up to take a peek. Um, and there's that clot, or maybe you don't, and maybe you just close your eyes and hope that it's still there and it's not bleeding underneath. Um, but you see that clot form in there, and that, that's what you see is that mesh work. Okay, so that's the clot stabilizer. Questions to this point? I'm throwing a whole bunch of, of concepts out there. So, once you've got that clot, you 
got this caught, so we've got all these platelets. We'll draw the vessel here. And we've got these activated platelets with the little arms. And they're all sitting and linked together. And then we've got this fibrous mesh and we've stabilized the clot and we're high-fiving and that all looks great. Um, what happens now? That's the next question. Like, well, how do we balance that? Because if that just keeps happening, then that little that blood vessel is basically just going to clot itself off. You have no flow. That's a thrombosis. Um, you hear about deep vein thrombosis. So that's that's a swing of the pendulum too far, where you've actually formed fibrin clot and it's stuck in the vessel, and then the blood can't flow past it. That's a whole nother talk, thrombosis. Um, and we can we can go through the reversal of this talk at some point too. So how what are the, the mechanisms for what happens now? With this stabilization we talked about, the platelets themselves actually think they actually contract. So the platelets have actin and myosin within them, and there's a mechanism within the cells themselves that they actually contract. And if you think about like doing if you're in the gym and you're doing like chest flies or whatever, and you're actually squeezing it together. So it's pulling those walls together to try to get it to heal. And that helps to, to form uh, healing of the, of the vessel wall itself. But we need to get rid of this, this clot that's inside here, because otherwise, again, it's going to block. So how do we do that? So your body's got all these check factors, again, that also help to break up the clot. Plasminogen, and if you think back, remember back where I said factor is produced by the liver? Well, plasminogen is another one of these components that's produced by the liver. And it's a check factor. This is called tissue plasminogen activator. I don't know, has anybody, anybody heard of TPA? Yeah, so we get clot buster drug, right? So TPA. So this is it. We've got it. Um, endogenously in our blood. What it does is it links, it actually activates plasminogen to turn into plasmin. Plasmin is dating myself, Pac-Man. Hmm. Okay, so plasmin is like Pac-Man. It's basically going to go into that fibrin clot and eat up uh, the fibrin and break it up. And then the clot is itself is actually healing and the vessel wall is healing and this is all D dimers. And that's again just byproducts of plasma eating it up. If you've heard of D dimers being ordered in the hospital, mm -hmm. um, that's a very non specific way for us to look at clotting activity or sorry um, clot degradation in the body. It's not very uh, specific, so it doesn't tell us where it's happening. It can be, it can happen for a multitude of reasons. It can be inflammatory causes and everything else, or it can be because they truly do have a clot. And we usually use it to try to determine whether we're going to image somebody for a DVT or a pulmonary embolus or that type of thing. So that's where the D-dimer comes from, and the D-dimer acid comes from. Okay, that's how we check and balance the formation of that fibrin clot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now everybody's sitting there and going, how the hell is this relevant to me? We're gonna have, we've got all this plasma, we've got all this stuff. Um, so how is this actually relevant to what we're doing in the pre-hospital realm? So I just wanted to think about where on the, on the handbook in the handbook and the treatment guidelines, where are some medications or protocols that may influence what we just talked about? Hemostatic balance, primary, secondary hemostasis. Um, TXA inside our trauma guidelines would be affecting this process pretty directly. Yeah, good, TXA, good example, great example. Yeah, that's one of the primary ones for sure. And so we'll go through that. I got I've got a case, and we'll we'll kind of walk through TXA a little bit about the mechanism. Anything else 
that might be that might influence what we do in the treatment guidelines? ASA? Aspirin? Aspirin? Yeah, absolutely. Aspirin is another one for sure. Um, those are the two big ones that I kind of pulled out. There may be ones that I'm missing. If anybody has any others, and I'm like, oh, geez, I dropped anything with that. I went through the, actually went through the formulary, uh, the drug monographs, and tried to pull any out that I could that I could find. I mean, obviously, traumatic bleeding. We, we I talked about this in the trauma talk, so we're not going to go down those pathways. Um, and in some of the in our some of the critical care guidelines, uh, there's obviously other things that you know, giving TPA and monitoring you know, heparin infusions and all that type of thing, that's all. And I think that understanding heparin infusions, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I think that's an important thing because, you know, if you're doing intrafacility transfers um, and maybe they've had heparin, they have a heparin infusion running, you're, you're, the nurse is in the back with you, um, it's good to have a context as to where all that stuff is coming from, right? I think it's important. Um, I was just uh, wanted to add about uh, normal saline admin just for permissive hypotension and trauma is how we can affect this process just by giving too much saline. Yeah, that's one of the theories and the premises behind for permissive hypotension. One is to reduce the actual mechanical uh, stress on on clot itself by reducing the amount of blood pressure that we're driving past blood that we're driving past that clot that's trying to stabilize itself. And then two is diluting out those so already your blood, you've dumped, dumped out a whole bunch of blood, so you've dumped out your plasma, and that's where your factors are actually carried, right? They're produced in the liver, but they're carried in your plasma. You've dumped out a bunch of that, diluted it, and now you're going to add salty water in to dilute it out more. So that's a very good point. Okay, so that's that's great. Let's Now, there's other things, too, that that's not in the guideline, but patients that you're going to transfer or transport, you're going to get called and we'll go through, we'll see this with some of the cases and I guarantee you've seen some form of these cases at some point. So there's the first case, just have a quick read. Have issues? Well, he, he's on blood thinners, he's on Plavix, he's on ASA, he's on beta walker, hypertension meds. Uh, yeah, and so, it was four weeks post op, uh, and he has a stents in? Yeah, but he had the stents put in four weeks ago. Yeah. And now he's on dual antiplatelet. Yeah. The uh, drug eluding stents are <clears throat> probably not helping either. How so? Um, they'd be um, putting out some sort of a drug to uh, prevent clotting as well, right? So they'd be a permanent, yes. semi-permanent source of um, of that um, medication in the system. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, great thought. So the drug eluting stents do have. That's why they're called drug eluting, and they do have like an antiplatelet, like a localized antiplatelet agent. It's not truly uh, highly um, systemic. The amount that is actually put out. It's to prevent that local thrombosis from forming, um, but yeah, absolutely, that's a really good consideration. So, how how do ASA and Plavix work? I don't ask. I'm not. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I just want you in your head to think about what's the the background pathophysiology between behind the mechanism of action of aspirin. We talked before about where in the protocols do we see could we influence this pathway. Aspirin is definitely one of them. Why do you give aspirin? I've heard blood thinner, but how is it a blood thinner? Antiplatelet. It's an antiplatelet, right? Now, do Plavix, well, they're both antiplatelets, ASA and Plavix. Do they both work by the same mechanism? Obviously, that's a loaded question. So, no. Obviously. So, let's, let's just have a quick look through. Um, ASA works. Is a cox. Primarily. So this is the arachidonic acid pathway. Wow, I'm going to make 
my, I made myself dizzy here. Um, so we think about there's two different pathways in the in COX. Basically, the ar arachidonic acid splits up into COX-1 and COX-2. Each one of them have their own mechanisms. There's also this 5-LOX, which is not really one that we always worry about, but it's, it's there. So the most common ones are COX-1 and COX-2. So inflammatory stimuli are what trigger the COX-2 pathway. So sprain your ankle, whatever, cause some kind of inflammation. So prostaglandins, so PGI-1, PGI-2, induce inflammation and fever and pain. And so, if, I don't know if you remember back, does anybody remember, does anybody remember Biox? It's, um, there's this big issue with Biox back in the day, which was a selective COX-2 inhibitor. So it blocked, it says here, so non-selective, but COX-2 NSAIDs. That, there was this huge thing because it, everybody was on Biox because it was great for inflammation if you had OA or whatever. However, it was found to have significant, now I don't remember the exact issues with it. it I think it actually had, uh, it was cardiac. That was the problem. It was, it was actually inducing um, early um, coronary artery disease. Um, and that was the issue. So it got pulled and there was a big stink about it way back in the day. Non-selective NSAIDs, so aspirin being the one, has a couple of different mechanisms has a thromboxane A2 mechanism, and it has, again, the PGI1 and PG2, um, where it has yeah, actually cytoprotection for your um, stomach. And so this is its natural, so naturally happens, it's constitutive, it, this COX pathway go, is, happens. But then if it gets blocked by ASA, so ASA actually blocks this pathway, what it does to the platelet is it reduces its function. If you think back to when when I put that first diagram up where there was platelet aggregation, thromboxane A2 gets released uh, once it's been locked down into the collagen. So when there's a cut in the vessel wall, it locks down into the collagen, the platelet itself releases thromboxane A2. And then that thromboxane A2 is what helps to change it or conform it into an activated platelet. And so the, the ASA is stopping that from happening by blocking the COX-1. And we do that, and it's been shown to have some, now maybe is starting to be refuted to be put on prophylactic ASA, but after having a PCI or a stent or something like that, the last thing you want to happen is to have a whole bunch of platelets now with this foreign body in a coronary artery to get triggered and to start aggregating and forming a platelet plug within the, the stent itself. And that's the premise behind, uh, behind doing that. So this is just another, uh, again, a diagram. This is, here's the thromboxane A2 um, pathway where it actually blocks, and it blocks the, the production of the thromboxane A2. And so the, it doesn't trigger that, uh, that little receptor on the outside. Up here, we have ADP, the receptor antagonist, which is going to be your clopidogrel and ticagrelor. So if we think about, so this is in the context of coronary artery disease where we've got plaque disruption, um, but this also happens just in an inflammatory uh, pathway. That von Willebrand factor that we talked about was in the collagen where the platelet initially sticks to. Um, the ADP gets released and recruits more platelets. So we talked about re releasing that ADP and recruiting more platelets and activating more platelets, much along the same pathway as the thromboxane A2. Well, ADP itself as a receptor gets blocked by these, these drugs. Pitagorel and Ticagrelor work a little bit differently. We're not gonna go into the crazy mechanism behind them. Um, I'll tell you that Ticagrelor itself works directly, does not have to be metabolized before it's active. So that's why if you pick somebody up and they say, I'm on Ticagrelor, they'll be on twice daily dosing. It's got a shorter half-life, um, and so people take it twice daily. It's more expensive right now because it's new and it's sexy and people make more money off of it when they're newer and they're sexier. Um, it also has good evidence in the context of, for those in Vancouver and Kelowna, um, has good evidence 
uh, that it is quicker onset and improves outcomes in patients undergoing primary PCI. So if you're taking them into the cath lab, um, right now that the new 2019 Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines say that ticagrelor actually has a better profile, has a little bit higher bleeding profile than Plavix, but has a better profile for um, outcomes uh, in that context. If you're at a site that does thrombolysis primarily, Plavix is still the is still the go-to. So you'll still get a Plavix load at sites like here, Prince George, um, and I know that's that type of thing. Um, you will get a Plavix load because it has less bleeding risk. Plavix or clopidogrel, sorry, um, works works indirectly. It works. It has to get metabolized in the liver first, and then it's the metabolite that actually triggers its function on the ADP. Uh, release and receptors. So a little bit different mechanism with them, um, but that's that's essentially how they work. And then there's all these other fancy ones that, you know, are used, and some of these are ones that are actually, you know, the drug-eluting stent uh, contain some of these GP2B3A inhibitors um, that work locally. Uh, there was, they, they were looking at these before, but are, they're have, they have a much higher bleeding risk um, associated with them, so they've kind of fallen off a little bit, but I'm sure we're going to see new ones come out in the next five to ten years. Any questions about that? If you want to learn more, so here's a resource. I'll list this again at the end. This is Thrombosis Canada. It has its own app. It's essentially um, an organization that puts together all the, the current guidelines on um, management of anticoagulants, antiplatelets. Um, it's a great resource, open access, free resource, um, and, and synthesizes the, uh, the literature on, uh, on these things. So it's just a little a referral. Again, I have no, I disclaim, I have no financial interest in this whatsoever. I just find it helpful. Okay, next case. No one's ever seen this case before. It's completely <laughs> unique. So obvious concerns right now for this guy, penetrating trauma, um, he's shocky, he's got criteria for uh, trauma activation, uh, you're going to be transported quickly, and again, we, we alluded to at RCH there, spoke up about uh, the role of TXA in our protocols giving that uh, in the context of trauma. So what is TXA? You knew I was going to ask it. Um, An antifibrinolytic agent? Yeah, exactly, antifibrinolytic. Where does it work? Basically affecting our coagulation cascade right at the end, just the degradation of those clots. It, Probably not, it's not an immediate onset, but later on in surgery, it'll just help those clots stay around is basically how I understood it. Yep. Okay, so good. Let's go back to go back to the diagram again. And little do you know, you're getting spaced repetition right now. Um, so this is clot breakdown, right? Um, and we talked about, again, plasminogen formed in the liver, right? It's floating around in your blood. It gets activated by tissue plasminogen activator, and then there's all these other like um, negative feedback and, and uh, checks and balances that are that hold back this pathway um, if if indicated. But the tranexamic acid itself actually works and stops the plasminogen from turning into Pac-Man and okay. plasmin, so it blocks that pathway. A little bit of a different diagram here. Here's your tranexamic acid down on the bottom. Um, and it negatively influences the, again, the transfer from plasminogen to plasmin, and then also influences, if you do have active plasmin, also helps this to reduce its action directly on the fibrin. I'm not gonna get down to the, to the actual, the full-on biochemical side. 
if you look over here, you mentioned coagulation cascade, so that's that's exactly it. It's like the tail end, like you said. Here's the coagulation cascade up here. So we talked about primary, remember primary hemostasis, which is vasoconstriction and platelet plug, and then secondary, and that's the coagulation cascade. We talked about intrinsic, extrinsic mm -hmm. pathways, ultimately forming thrombin, and then thrombin is what's going to trigger with fibrinogen forming fibrin. We're on the other side of the pathway, so we're going to try to enhance this and make sure that that fibrin stays stable by not breaking it down. Tetranic amic acid is now used, it's in the context of trauma, it's, I mean, we use it in uh, surgical bleeding, now epistaxis, we're packing people's nose. We talked about that guy with epistaxis, well, it's not a, don't go do that, don't go and soak gauze in your tranic amic acid, please, because I will get in trouble for <laughs> promoting that from this round. Don't do that. But we do it in eMERGE. We do take tranexamic acid, dilute it, soak gauze in it, and then pack it in people's noses, um, come in with severe epistaxis. It's one management method. It's being used like for a multitude of things. And then the you know the CRASH-3 trial, uh, which is being done in traumatic brain injury, uh, which is a PCHS uh, is involved. Uh, did that, Rob Schlamp uh, gave a talk on that at Canrock. Um, there's all kinds of things that's coming out. So I think it's important, again, I'm just reiterating the importance of understanding the, the primary basis as to why we do these things, and not just because it sits in our protocols. Okay, third case. <clears throat> Issues? Just the risk of a cerebral hemorrhage or whatever layer that brain bleed could be at. Yeah. So he, he tells you, I'm fine, dude. Like, I, I literally fell off my bike. I'm fine. I'm going to keep riding. Everybody's like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I would, because I didn't think that. I agree. I totally agree with you. Um, I just think he's such high risk. We'd really have to. Um, talk to him about, especially with that hemophilia history, that even smaller bumps, especially for him, could result in slow bleeds that take effect over hours or even days, and he really just needs a quick scan to safely rule this out. Sure. Does anybody here have hemophilia or have a family member with it? Has anybody picked up someone with a potentially significant bleed with hemophilia? Okay. This is a real case. So I saw this case two weeks ago. This kid walked in. He was smart enough at least to walk in. I don't know what he'd been doing with his buddies when he was in the skate park uh, before riding, but then not wearing a helmet for sure, fell off his bike, and then at least had the wear to to come in. These guys carry a card with them. They should always carry a card with them to tell you what degree of severity they have of hemophilia. So each person has a little bit different influence. So some people that are severe means that they have essentially um, zero, like one percent factor activity. And so we'll talk through just a little bit about it. But if you pick up somebody, just a, a good learner, if you ever do pick up somebody with hemophilia, ask them if they have their cart. Um, they should be carrying the young guys that are bulletproof, maybe a little bit less, um, but they should be carrying that. So hemophilia. Uh, there's a, there's hemophilia C2, which is much more rare, but the, the, the ones that you're commonly going to see are hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Hemophilia B is sometimes called Christmas disease, factor 9 deficiency. It's not as common as hemophilia A, um, but they all come with the same premise, and they're, again, they're fairly significant. So here's a really complicated uh, diagram of the cascade again, and I apologize for that, but so factor eight, factor eight, two big areas where factor eight actually works. Um, and it's it's absolutely vital to the propagation of the, the coagulation cascade. 
really great and that cascade again we want to form thrombin so that the thrombin can link with fibrinogen to make the fibrin but you're never going to get there if you're lacking especially this kid's severe so he's got less than one percent um, factor activity and then you've got nine is just before it um, which is simply B. this is a this is a good this is called factor first so you guys know it's uh, when I went when I had this case um, I, I used this as a resource before I ultimately talked to hematology but the, these guys and I agree you, you know you said this guy needs to be transported because he needs a scan but before he even gets a scan with a severe bleed so life or limb threatening bleeds you see down in this bottom corner here life or limb threatening including you know big muscle hematomas vaginal bleeding everything else you treat them up front before you even scan them. So I, I was on the horn and I, had to t I talked to our local lab to make sure we had enough factor um, to give this guy. And there's calculations that we do in order to make sure that we get his factor level up, especially in life threatening bleeds, 80 to 100 percent. Obviously, we're not going to do that in the protocols, but I, I'm just going to let you know that once they hit the emerge, it's like it's relatively significant that we do this. That we do this. These guys are actually quite good and that if they're alert with it, it's probably faster for him because he's so linked in with the blood bank, he could probably walk downstairs to our lab and get the factor faster than mm -hmm. just ordering it and having to go through the consent process. Um, and his mom was kind of laughing when I was like, okay, like calling blood bank and everything. Like, well, I'll just walk downstairs and get it. Mm -hmm. um, she knew exactly how much. But I talked to hematology in Vancouver to consult on this, that this is what I was doing and they, they agreed. They, you do need to give them that initial dose, but because the half-life is about 12 hours long, you also need to subsequently repeat dose them. And you have a low threshold to watch them for a period of time afterwards because they can, like you mentioned, they can bleed by like a slow bleed over time as well. So you need to make sure they have, when we send them home, we got to make sure they have a good follow-up and close monitoring. Okay, case four. It was like the grossest picture I could find. <laughs>
okay? But the direct thrombin inhibitors, which are the was the first ones to come out, are dabigatran, and they worked directly on thrombin itself, and they block the thrombin itself, so one step downstream. So dabigatran, again, was one of these that probably came out about 10 years ago. Yeah, probably. Somewhere around 10 years ago, yeah. monitoring for these. Um, there's no monitoring pathway. They're more expensive because they're a new drug, um, but there's no monitoring required. The, the issue with them being is you can't reverse them as well. Initially, you couldn't reverse dabigatran. Now, you, we do have a drug that can reverse dabigatran, and it's a monoclonal clonal antibody. Right? This is a trying to make sure I put the name right anyway. So it's fancy name. It's, it is not cheap, it's like thousands and thousands of dollars to reverse it, but it, there is potential to do it. We do carry it here. Um, but it, the studies now head to head are showing that there's more bleeding uh, typically with dabigatran, and it's, it's actually falling out of favor a little bit. We're seeing less and less people on the dabigatran, twice daily dosing, et cetera. So there's a bunch of things that are making it a little bit less. Um, sexy, and the studies are starting are supporting the 10A inhibitors a little bit more. However, there is no reversal for these. So if somebody comes in with a massive GI bleed like that, we're stuck. Uh, we still give a lot of the same things. We'll give factor replacement, so things like Octoplex, which is, has eight factors linked in with it. Um, we may give FFP, depending. It's almost like you throw the kitchen sink at them, give them cryo, cryo which is fibrinogen. You, you might give them a whole bunch of different things, but there's no agent to directly reverse it. Mm -hmm. okay? So I think it's important because you're going to start trans, or you will, I mean, you maybe you already have, when you're taking that history on blood thinners, um, some people don't even know what this is. Usually they're, they're relatively well informed, but if you see on their med profile that, make sure that you make a note. Questions? What's the half-life on those uh, drugs, the XAs? Half-life, yeah. So initially, you, the like the river rocks, but each one of them has its own, essentially has its own profile. But the river rocks have been up front, like if you're giving it, uh, if they have a new, say a PE or whatever, for the first 21 days, it's relatively short, and it's, so it's like twice daily dosing, and then you step down to single daily dosing as it gets into your system. Um, but the rest of the pharmacokinetics, I would, I, I mean, I'd have to look up the actual monograph on each one of them themselves, but it, it is definitely specific with each one. That's its own profile, and that's why the bigger trans twice daily dosing, um, as opposed to single daily, like the River Rocks band, a band, you'll see them ultimately long term will be just single daily dosing. So it's got a relatively long half life. All right, case five. And obviously, I mean, if you saw this case up front, you might just go, well, you slipped and fell, maybe you broke your kneecap, or who knows, right? That's the number one thing on your differential diagnosis. This is a talk on bleeding. So you can see this knee is huge. Um, this isn't a true uh, picture of the knee, but that knee is huge, and the patient's on warfarin. So you have to start thinking about hemarthrosis with this, or significant bleeding into that joint considering the context of, of trauma. So warfarin, where does warfarin work? How does warfarin work? So it's in the realm of vitamin K antagonists, yeah? So these factors, a lot of them are vitamin K dependent. So they need 
vitamin K in order to work or propagate themselves. And so certain one of the ones of them are actually dependent on that, and warfarin acts to directly block at that vitamin, the vitamin K. So it's an antagonist of vitamin K. How the hell are you going to remember? So it's 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, protein S. Um, those are the factors that are vitamin K dependent. You can either pound that into your head, or you can proudly stand up <laughs> and say the Canadians beat the Soviets in 1972. So the classic teaching for uh, remembering what are the vitamin K uh, dependent factors. So factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. 2, 7, 9, and this is a 10. Yep. And then protein C and protein S. Those are the vitamin K. And that's where warfarin works. Um, and as you all know, we follow INRs on these patients. So their INR, especially with a valve, the target INR, a normal INR is like is one essentially. And there's, and then we're not going to talk about the laboratory assays and, and how we measure clotting times and all that type of thing. Um, but in somebody with a valve, INR elevated two to three, so they're significantly higher risk for bleeding with an INR at that point. But because the risk of the valve thrombosing, they have to be on lifelong anticoagulation. We can reverse this somewhat. There's ways we can do it. We can give those vitamin K dependent factors back to people. So there's things like FFP plasma or FFP. We have things called Octoplex, which is basically factor replacement um, that we can get in order to reverse this process. Um, and so we can deal with it uh, on a more acute basis if there's significant bleeding than we can with the 10A inhibitors that we talked about before. However, it is when you give, as a patient, if anybody's on it, I, I mean, I'm not on it, but I see a lot of patients on it, it's it's a lot of work. you got to have your INR monitor all the time. You have to watch out what vegetables, you, you know, there's a whole bunch of things out there that make it a little bit uh, clumsier when it comes to uh, to taking it logistically. <laughs> All right. So everybody's thinking, are we done? We are almost done. Almost. So I just want to go through seven key learning points. Takeaways. No way that you're going to remember everything I talked about. I'm not going to remember everything that I just talked about. Um, but key highlights, just as a review, again, spaced repetition. Learning point one, platelets come from the bone marrow, factors and other stuff, plasminogen, come from the liver. Um, platelets flow around in the blood, they're a component, um, the factors and what are a component of your plasma. Learning point two, talked about the four foundations of hemostatic balance, primary hemostasis, Vasoconstriction and the platelet plug formation. Secondary hemostasis is that proper initiation, propagation, and amplification of the clotting cascade, and ultimately we're going to form thrombin. And then the clot gets stabilized because fibrinogen turns into fibrin and then becomes insoluble and stabilizes that clot. And remember, the platelet itself squeezes that blood vessel, blood vessel edges together to tighten up that that clot process. And then we have to give, we have to be able to inhibit coagulation because it can swing too far the other way. We didn't talk about that too, too much. We didn't talk as much about um, antithrombin, uh, protein C and S, which are the checks on the other side to make sure it doesn't keep propagating itself. That's where heparins and stuff like that are going to work. Okay, that's another talk we could we can bring that in um, maybe on a, on a subsequent talk. But then you also have to break down that clot so that it doesn't stay there um, once that vessel is healed up itself. And so that's where the plasminogen, which is formed in the liver, converts the plasmin and then Pac-Man's the fibrin and breaks it down into D-dimer products that flow around in your blood. Learning point three, we, we know aspirin is in the protocol, vinegaril and tricagulor antiplatelets. Aspirin works on the COX-1 pathway, blocks that thromboxane release. Clopidogrel works on the ADP receptor irreversibly, and to it, it reversibly blocks 
again, the ADP receptor, a little bit different mechanisms, but both of them um, are being used commonly. So be aware of them. They're out there that they do have a different uh, mechanism. Tranexamic acid, learning point four, obviously it's an antifibrinolytic. You guys are well aware of that. It's great. And it's now, hopefully, you know that it works down in that uh, clot breakdown pathway at the tail end. Um, that degrades the fibrin, stops that from happening, so blocks the, the plasminogen and the plasmin from breaking down the fibrin. So anti-fibrinolytic. Hemophilia is serious business. Don't mess around. If you're going to transport one of these, ask for their card. Ask for how much factor they take regularly. These people actually give themselves factor, so they'll, they'll, they dose themselves, um, and they have access to it through the bank. They're highly educated on it. Um, so it's good to know about it here, especially if you're going to transport. The direct oral anticoagulants, again, direct thrombin is to be trans. The 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban all have XA in the name. They have no reversal agent. This one does have a reversal agent. And the last thing are the vitamin K antagonists, which is warfarin that work on those factors that work in the cascade or on secondary hemostasis, and that's 2, 7, 9, 10 along with protein CNS. We can reverse that component if people have a significant bleed. All right, so we have a mix of um, the audience right now. I'm sure some of them are going, oh, this is awkward, uh, but we're done, we're done. Um, this lady right here, she's really upset, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make her happier by letting you know. This resource is free open access, bloody easy. Um, so this is the Ontario, uh, oh man, I can't remember, it's Ontario Regional Blood Coordinate, Coordinating Network. They put out these series of books. So bloody easy actually has a, a transfusion book. Um, and they also have this coagulation simplified. A lot of the diagrams that I've referred to are from this book. It's an easy read. It also walks you through how they do all the blood assays, so measuring INR, PTT, thrombin time, D-dimers. Um, it's a great resource. You just have to Google bloody easy coagulation simplified, and the first hit will take you to Thrombosis Canada, and they'll give you a direct link. Um, so if you're looking for some free, read, free, free time reading, um, I would highly recommend this. Some of the other pathways I, I did were Physiology of the Clans. It's just a book that I used through medical school. It costs 40 bucks um, through Amazon, and it gives the I mean it gives bleeding component, but it's literally like two pages on each system, and gives you a very high level summary of physiology of multiple systems. And this is just one of them. So I don't have any shares in this book. Maybe I should. Um, but I thought it was good. It's a UK resource, so you do have to take that into context when you're reading through it. Again, the Thrombosis Canada app, uh, I think is a, a really valuable resource. Um, I used it on ship last night. And then that's my email. I'm happy to answer questions, um, discuss anything. Uh, just drop me an email anytime. Any questions or comments? That was fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Bresser.